Um, so thanks everyone for being here. My name is Virginia Smith. I'm one of the co-organizers along with Peter Riktarik, Aurelian Zele, and uh, Dan Alistar. Uh, we run the, the Flow Seminar and we're very fortunate to have Stephen Wu with us today. So Stephen is an assistant professor at Carnegie Mellon University, does a lot of interesting work um, on privacy and fairness. And today we'll be talking about some of his recent work and looking at privacy for gradient-based optimization. Um, so I think we mentioned this <laughs> before the talk started, but if you have any questions, uh, Actually, Sam, what is the best way? Just raising your hand in, in Zoom or how are questions typically handled? Can you remind me? Yeah, so, so either raise your hand or just uh, post question to chat and then set visibility to, to everybody. And then we just, yeah. just unmute to give in person. <laughs> okay. okay, perfect. Yeah, so raise your hand, we can unmute you or you can post something in the, in the chat window and um, Stephen will help to make sure you, you see questions if, if something comes up. Great. Um, but yeah, yeah, I'll just pass it over to you then, Stephen. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Junior, for the introduction, and thanks for inviting me to speak at this seminar. Uh, it's actually uh, very nice to to start giving a talk early in the morning, and at this flow seminar, and feel like you get a lot done. Uh, so this is definitely something special. Uh, yeah, so I want to talk about uh, some of uh, our recent work. Uh, in the area of private optimization. Uh, so before I start, I, I want to acknowledge my collaborators. Uh, so there, there are roughly two pieces of work I want to talk about. Uh, the first piece is with a uh, PhD student, Xiang Yi Chen at uh, University of Minnesota uh, and my colleague, Min Yi Hong. Uh, and the second piece is with a uh, very, very good student, Ying Shui Zhou, also at University of Minnesota and uh, my colleague, Arindam Banerjee. Uh, I, I really want to uh, give the credit to the students who are really the driving force behind these projects. Um, so um, increasingly, uh, we are training deep learning models on sensitive private data. And over the past few years, uh, we have seen interesting and surprising sometimes uh, sort of attacking examples where you can see the model may leak sensitive information about the training data uh, sometimes in ex unexpected ways. Um, and we also have been thinking about how to mitigate this sort of uh, attack or privacy leakage. Uh, a very popular approach and the approach that's close to my heart is to think about uh, providing formal differential privacy guarantee. Uh, so for this talk, I will mostly just give a you know, informal definition, but if it helps think about this as sensitive training data set, and what we would like to do is to have an algorithm that select or train some sort of uh, ML model. Um, and roughly speaking, we're gonna say an algorithm is differentially private if you train, if you change any single data record in the data set, it does not uh, alter the output distribution by much. Uh, so you can think about, uh, for example, if Alice data was originally in the data set, um, and the algorithm will output some uh, distribution over some ML models. So for now, think about the algorithm as randomized. Uh, if we swap Alice data uh, with Bob's data uh, and have the algorithm run, run on this alternative data set again, uh, we would like to guarantee that the output distribution of uh, learning models are roughly the same. Uh, so if you see a, a train model coming from either of these distribution, you can't really tell which distribution is coming from, and therefore you, you may not be able to infer what Alice or Bob's data look like. So it's a very nice uh, information theoretic formal guarantee. Um, and I'm gonna flash the formal definition here, but for the sake of this talk, uh, if you haven't seen this definition so far, it's not that important to remember it. Uh, if you have seen this definition uh, before, then it should be uh, easy, it should, it should be easy thing to you know, reason about for you. Uh, but the key quantity I want to highlight is that this is uh, a differential privacy is a stability concept of property that is quantifiable. Uh, importantly, it's actually quantifiable using this parameter epsilon. So uh, sometimes we'll call the algorithms epsilon differentially private or epsilon delta differentially private. Uh, the key parameter to remember is that this is the, the parameter epsilon is quantifying the, the privacy loss or privacy leakage from the algorithm. Uh, and it's independent of the data. Uh, 
So, um, so the scope of this talk uh, will roughly about a simple form of problem. Uh, so uh, we would like to take in a collection of private data. Uh, let's call it S1 to SN. Uh, we would like to uh, train a ML model by solving some, some form of empirical risk minimization. Uh, so in particular, we would like to minimize some, some loss function F that is really an uh, average loss uh, across uh, the end data points. So I'm gonna use uh, X to denote the model, uh, which uh, in, in, in live in a D-dimensional parameter space. And we'd like to solve this problem subject to differential privacy. Okay, so this is a simple formulation that captured a wide range of problems. Uh, and we're definitely not the first to think about this. And People have thought about this and sort of nowadays the, the go-to method to solve this problem with differential privacy uh, is essentially a variant of stochastic gradient descent uh, called DPSGD. Uh, I'm gonna stage the first variant and I will explain why this variant is sort of a, a theory algorithm, uh, but here it goes. Uh, so basically the, this is obviously an iterative algorithm. Uh, each iteration uh, will first compute uh, Gradient estimate using a mini batch. Okay, so we'll take out a mini batch a certain size randomly from the data set, uh, take the average of the gradient. Uh, and then before I perform the update, I will uh, also add noise to perturb the gradient estimate. Uh, so you can think about the Gaussian noise is doing the work for differential privacy in the sense that I would like to uh, ensure that no single example uh, that, you know, participate in the gradient estimate computation have a larger influence on the entire training process. The Gaussian noise denoted by Z, ZT here is really just trying to hide the influence from any single training example in the gradient estimate. Okay, so, so there's formal proof to do that. Uh, but uh, because we want to privacy, differential privacy hold for any data set, uh, we actually need to make some assumption for the differential privacy guarantee to hold. In particular, if you look at some of these privacy proof, at least in theory, uh, it has to assume that the underlying individual loss function L is Lipschitz. Uh, in particular, it's Lipschitz for all input, all possible inputs you might have uh, X, okay. Uh, and because of that, you can actually bound the individual gradient in the data set uh, by the same Lipschitz constant, um, which give you a way to actually set the variance of the noise or the standard deviation of the Gaussian noise to, to scale with this Lipschitz constant so that it will be able to hide the influence from any single gradient. Okay, so I won't go into the formal proof of this, uh, but I hope the intuition makes sense. The key thing I want to highlight here is that uh, this privacy proof assumption is pretty strong, right? Uh, so we are assuming the in individual loss function L is, is Lipschitz for all possible input X. Uh, so typically we may make this kind of assumption in establishing uh, optimality uh, for com convergence. Uh, in, in, for, for those, I, I, would, I would think, you know, maybe you can be more generous and lenient It may not, but, the loss function may not be ellipsis everywhere, uh, but the convergence proof can still approximate the truth. Um, but here we really need this uh, ellipsis assumption to hold even in the worst case, because we are providing worst case formal privacy guarantee. So this is really a strong assumption that almost all the time you, you, it's hard to, to meet in, in practice. Uh, even if the loss function is ellipsis, it's hard to say what ellipsis constant uh, you will get. Okay, for this reason, this is not the algorithm you typically run, uh, not the algorithm is that's, that's implemented in TensorFlow. Uh, so there's a sort of a practical variant of this algorithm. Um, in particular, you would sort of uh, also compute a gradient estimate on a mini batch. But in this case, because you don't know how to bound the L2 norm or the scale of individual gradient, you're performing some sort of clipping operation. This is called gradient clipping. Um, so I will uh, talk about it in a second. But uh, after you do the clipping on individual gradient and you take the average, now you're doing the same thing. You basically uh, take the sort of the 
gradient estimate from the clip gradients, you add the same Gaussian noise, and then you, you do your model update. Okay, so what's this gradient clipping doing? Um, it's basically some sort of shrinking operation. Uh, so whenever your gradient G is, has norm above some clip threshold C, uh, I will shrink it so that it will exactly have the L2 norm C. But if the gradient has norm already smaller than C, I'm not gonna do anything because the, the gradient norm is already, already small enough. Um, so the proof intuition is uh, about the same. So uh, what you would do is you set the, the Gaussian noise scale to a, a sort of large enough to scale with C so that it cover the influence from, from any single training example or, or, any, or the gradient from any single training example. So uh, during the training, you'll be hiding the influence for uh, any example that they may have. And therefore you get differential privacy. So you can put these things together and, and basically prove uh, the differential privacy guarantee for, for this kind of algorithm. Um, so this is a, 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 by now somewhat the standard guarantee you can have. Uh, so you can get this kind of epsilon dollar differential privacy as long as your noise is properly scaling with the clipping threshold and also the number square root in the number of iteration you may run. Okay, so uh, we, don't need to go over that. Uh, my key point is this may, may be okay for, for differential privacy because it's just another way to decrease the influence from any single example and applying the same Gaussian noise mechanism to ensure differential privacy. Uh, but potentially this kind of clipping operation is actually making a lot of changes, modification in your training trajectory. Uh, so there hasn't been much understanding uh, in how the kind of clipping operation might influence the training process in terms of uh, convergence and optimality. So I'm going to use this uh, as a starting point for, for this talk. Uh, so the first part of the talk will basically think about what exactly is the effect of clipping on, on differentially private optimization. Uh, so in terms of uh, achieving optimality or, if, or stationarity uh, or convergence. Um, and then I, I want to point out that clipping itself is really just a special case of projection. So clipping here, uh, you can think of it almost as when the vector is too large, you shrink its L2 norm. So you're basically projecting the point or the vector into a ball of certain radius, in this case, radius of the clipping threshold C. Uh, but you can also more generally think about other forms of uh, projection uh, that is not necessarily a form of clipping. Uh, so you can think about uh, other structure in the gradients and also think about projecting down to it. Uh, and maybe somehow you can leverage this kind of gradient structure to get better out with it. Uh, so that, that will actually naturally lead to the second part of the talk. Uh, where we actually can think about what sort of gradient structure we may have and to design some sort of projection that might favor uh, either accuracy or convergence in the training. Uh, so in particular, in the second part of the talk, uh, we'll think about what, when there's low dimensional structure in the gradients, how do we leverage that using this idea of projection to achieve better accuracy? Okay. Um, and sort of a unifying theme from these two parts uh, is that uh, you, you really get to think about the underlying geometric structure in the gradient distributions, and it helps you understand the training behavior of these DPA SGD type of algorithms. And sometimes that allow you to reconfigure the algorithm to, to design uh, better ones. All right, let me go to the first part, which is uh, about thinking. Uh, or understanding the, the gradient clipping effect on, on private optimization. Um, so what exactly happens when you perform gradient clipping on individual gradients, uh, when you, you do this kind of um, optimization or private optimization? Uh, so it's, it's not hard to believe that uh, you can cook up with examples where uh, gradient clipping really screws things up. Uh, so let me give you a, a very simple 1D example, okay? So in this case, you can even think about the data set. We have uh, three data points. Um, 
So uh, it's really a one dimensional example with square laws. So you, you optimizing over model X and your data point is SI and you're taking average over this uh, square loss uh, across these three data points. Uh, so let's say S1 and S2 equals minus three and S3 equals nine. Uh, because this is um, minimizing a square loss, uh, the optimum is recovering the mean. So in this case, uh, the mean of the three uh, example, S1, S2, S3 is really just one. Okay, so, um, so if you look at the clipped gradient at X star, okay, so if you look at the clip gradient at X star, uh, the, the, I think this is a typo. Uh, the, the expected clip, clip gradient, if you clip it at one, uh, is actually non-zero. Uh, I apologize for the, the typo here. Um, and when you actually take the gradient actually around this optimality point, it actually pushes away from its optimal. Okay, so it's actually some, in some form, it, whenever you get close to the optimal X star, uh, you actually uh, get pushed away from the optimal and, and it, it keeps going, at least in expectation. And we'll run some numeric uh, simulation after this. Um, So uh, another example uh, uh, we have is, you know, think about an even simpler example where um, there are really two data points, S and minus three, uh, S1 equals three and S2 minus three. You're also minimizing uh, some sort of uh, square loss. Uh, so in this case, you should also be recovering the mean. So, so the mean is zero. So, so the optimal point you want to converge to is zero. Um, but then if you look at the clip gradient, it really is a clip derivative uh, for any point uh, in this bounded interval between minus two to two, uh, you see that the clip gradient, the expected clip gradient is zero. Okay, so whenever you reach, uh, you run your algorithm to reach this bounded interval, uh, in expectation, the gradient descent with clipping actually will encourage no, no more movement. Uh, actually, it doesn't actually give you uh, direction towards the minimum, which is the, the zero. Uh, and also, this will is a way you also prevent some sort of convergence. Uh, so this is more, more like a mental exercise. Think about what happened when you perform clipping on this gradient, and you can also run um, this is this kind of uh, numeric example on these two simple examples. So. Uh, the noise uh, injected in with the preferential privacy actually does not help. You would hope that the noise on top of the clip gradient estimate will actually encourage some sort of randomness. Uh, but at the end, it's still a zero mean noise. So it, it doesn't help to correct uh, the, the clipping bias you might uh, induce. Uh, so in particular, you're looking at two plots where the x-axis is the number of iterations you might run. The y-axis is... Um, the distance to the optimal point for the two instances. Uh, basically, uh, either stay far away from, from, the, from the optimal or it sort of oscillate around, but never get close. Okay. So uh, this is the kind of simple example you can hook up um, in thinking about sort of the adversarial effects of gradient clipping. Um, but another question you might ask is, does this kind of uh, bad cases really happen uh, in practice? Okay, so, so you can also run experiments to see this. Uh, so one simple experiment you could run uh, is to run DPSGD on, on Amnest uh, with uh, different clipping thresholds. So you can set the threshold uh, different like numbers like one or 0.1 and see how well it works. Um, it does have an effect on the, the training performance, but not much. And in, in both of these cases, uh, no matter how big, well, these two cases, whether you set it to one or 0.1, uh, it seems that the, the test accuracy remain about the same. Um, so this is uh, interesting. Uh, 
and we also want to look deeper into uh, this training process. Uh, so we want to actually take a glimpse at the gradient distribution. So uh, if you uh, sample a few number of epochs and look at the, the gradient distribution at each e epoch. Um, so you take a single iteration uh, and you look at the gradients, the, the individual gradient given by individual training example in, within this iteration. Um, what we do is that we're gonna take the angle between individual gradients and the average gradient, which is the true gradient we would like to estimate. And we're plotting sort of the histogram of the cosine uh, between these pa pairs of gradients. So again, the pair is defined by individual gradient and the true gradient. Um, so if you look at the histogram of cosine, uh, it roughly looks like these two diagrams, uh, two, two histogram plots uh, across the three, three snapshots of the training trajectory. Um, so uh, one thing we realized is that uh, although it's not perfectly symmetric, uh, some of this uh, angle plot does exhibit some sort of uh, symmetricity structure. Uh, so one thing that leads us to think about is whether some sort of symmetricity uh, might, might help in the gradient distribution might actually help uh, overcome uh, some sort of uh, clipping, uh, some sort of bias in the clipping operation. So this is sort of the question we want to think about. Uh, let me pause here in case there are questions. I think there was a question on the previous example. Uh, it's in the chat window it's about, um, I guess for this particular case, is it bad that we don't converge to the optimal X star? Yes. Because maybe that um, solution is not actually private. Oh yeah, so uh, this, Privacy doesn't quite come in, in this example just yet. Uh, so, so, but if you want to think about privacy, even though we don't exactly reach the X star equals zero, we would like to get close to some something like that. To that, that's something minus minus point. But the 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 key point I want to point out is that the gradient actually the clipping operation actually changed the gradient so much that uh, with the without privacy, you cannot converge to something close optimal. Okay, let Hi. me, yeah. Maybe just a quick question. Hi. Yes, uh, please. Hi. Uh, just on the histograms that you've shown, just to make sure I yeah. understood. So these are yeah. cosine between um, stochastic gradients, like clipped, but without noise, like the whole clip plus noise, or what is it exactly in this case that you're looking at? Uh, yeah, clipping doesn't change the angle, so that's nice. Uh, so uh, these yeah. are the angle between stochastic gradient and the true gradients. And I'm plotting for all the stochastic gradients. And this includes the GP noise or no? No DP noise. Yeah. Okay. No DP noise. Yeah. Okay. So the, the, okay. So you're yeah. just looking at the kind of normal uh, yet. stochastic gradient distribution. Yeah. That's right. Thanks. Um, thank you. Yeah. So this sort of motivated question whether some kind of symmetricity in the gradient distribution might help to lead to convergence even when there's clipping. Okay. So so I want to. Uh, Peel off the, the layers of complexity a little bit. Uh, there's a first, first thing uh, that may help us think about this, uh, this part with clipping uh, is to think about what exactly is the, the DPSGD or stochastic gradient with clipping is doing. So, so let's think about it even without the, uh, the differential privacy noise. Uh, at the end of the day, the differential privacy noise is really some sort of zero mean Gaussian noise. Uh, it should not change much of the behavior. Um, so uh, let me talk a little bit about the notations. Uh, so I'm gonna now think about without privacy for now, but I still want to think about a different form of noise, which is the stochastic gradient noise. So you, you can think about this as the, the sampling of the individual gradients in the data set, which might deviate from its average. So the average gradient is sort of the gradient of F, uh, but the individual gradient, for example, in the individual gradient, on an individual example, uh, you can think of them as the average gradient plus some zero mean noise. So these are stochastic gradient noise. Uh, and what we are doing essentially uh, is taking, so, so we run SGD, we're basically taking stochastic gradient, clip it and do update. Okay, so for now, let's not think about privacy noise. And, and this is really what exactly happens. Uh, 
so if you think about this simpler algorithm uh, without the privacy part, uh, one simple thing you can prove is that uh, is essentially driving down the average inner product across iterations. Uh, so the inner product is the, the, the true gradient in each iteration and the clip gradient at each iteration. So it's actually driving down this inner product over round. Okay, so it's uh, this product on average, inner product on average is going down uh, in the rate of roughly one over root t. Okay, so, so this type of inner product object might, might sort of show up when you think about the kind of proof of optimization. Um, yeah. But usually this is not where we stop, right? So the, the hope is that if this inner product uh, across rounds, uh, upper bounds, uh, the sum of the inner product squared, what, sorry, the, the gradient norm squared across rounds, uh, this means that the gradient norm squared across round is also di diminishing at some rate of one over root t. So if that's the case, uh, we, we are really in a good, good situation, right? Uh, this will allow us to show that the average gradient is really vanishing and going down to zero. And the algorithm actually is pushing uh, the eta rays to a first order stationary point. So for, for uh, at least for non-convex optimization, that is a reasonable goal for convergence to have. Okay, so, so this is perhaps a key step we would like to have, right? So we would like to show that the, the inner product between the clip gradient and the true gradient uh, over round should be a upper bound on the, the gradient norm squared uh, over round. Okay, um, so how do you make that happen and how does symmetricity come in uh, in this case? So, so let me give you a simple example uh, in, the, in the one dimensional case. Uh, so I, I like to think about square loss, so let me use that again. So I'm gonna think about uh, the loss I would like to minimize is sort of the mean estimation for Gaussian distribution. Uh, so I'm gonna minimize X minus A squared where A is drawn from some Gaussian, standard Gaussian. Um, so let's say I'm looking at the eta rate where X equals 0.5. Uh, so the model equals 0.5 and think about the, the gradient distribution and think about what happened to the, to the, the clip gradient. Um, so uh, in particular, uh, in this plot on the right, think about the dashed line as the PDF for the stochastic gradients. Uh, uh, in, because I'm playing X equals uh, 0.5 is centered at 0.5. Uh, it's really a Gaussian distribution. Um, and I'm clipping these stochastic gradient at around point uh, minus one to one because I'm setting a clipping threshold to one. Okay, so uh, if it helps you to think about it, all of the stochastic gradient outside of the red boundary will get pushed to this boundary. So all the points will be rounded into one and all the points uh, less than negative one will, will get uh, rounded to negative one. And we'll, we sort of take the expectation uh, with the probability, probability mass given by this Gaussian. Uh, so this is a 1D example. Uh, it, it could be fun to actually do it uh, in, in this talk. So let's think about how do you actually calculate the, the average over the, quick, uh, the expected clip gradient. Uh, so let me try to annotate. Uh, so there, there are a couple things uh, we can do. Uh, the first thing is that uh, there's some nice cancellations you could have. Um, the first part that there might be a cancellation is that if you look at uh, this boundary outside of the blue line or light blue line, um, if you look at these, the probability mass around these stochastic gradients, uh, and you take average around them, the weighted average given by the, the density, uh, it cancels out in the sense that uh, when you average over them, you exactly we cover this true gradient, which is the middle purple one. So when you take average, you exactly recover the true expectation you would like to approximate. Uh, uh, so this is, this is nice. So, so we, we call this the sort of like canceling region because it's sort of on the tails, and they're symmetric around its mean. And, and 
and because uh, we're not quite doing before or after gluing clipping, these these masses will will, will exactly match their, their true gradient. Okay. Um, the next part uh, that might be helpful to think about uh, is is the so the no clip boundary region. So so uh, so within this bound this region. Um, in this region, uh, um, oh, sorry, I, I apply on the wrong thing. Between this region and this region, okay. Uh, I'm actually not doing any clipping just yet because the clipping threshold is at the red line here. Uh, at the same time, if I think about this, sort of the symmetric area around its mean and within the clipping threshold, uh, I also can do some form of uh, cancellation in the sense that um, uh, if I average out these two regions, it will exactly match. I mean, if I match it point-wise, I will actually recover the, the true gradient, the true mean, the purple one. So this is nice. So the so outside of the, the blue region, I, I actually get recovered the true mean uh, within this green region, I recover the true mean. Uh, what's left is really uh, the remainder. So this is this region, uh, which is the trickier part. Uh, so this is uh, where the, the probability mass is still symmetric, uh, but the values of stoch stochastic gradients are different. Uh, but the nice thing is that if you start taking average across these two regions, it would not exactly recover uh, to the true mean. But the nice thing is that when you take average, it's, it's, you're going to recover something that's positive, right? So because there's a value here, it's just going to be larger. And because of that, you actually recover something that is aligned with the true true direction of the gradient. So you don't exactly recover you don't exactly recover the true gradient when taking the average and expectation but you at least recover the right direction. And therefore you hope that by taking the inner product, in this case, really a product, you get something positive or something that is scaling with the, the true gradient, uh, the normal true gradient. Okay. Um, so I, I hope this example makes sense. Let me pause here in case there are questions because that was maybe kind of a, a nice part. Um, Okay, I can revisit this uh, in a bit. Um, but you can also work harder to make this argument work for higher dimension. Uh, it, it, you know, so basically you can analyze this kind of stochastic, symmetric stochastic distribution in high dimension. So uh, in high dimension, you can think about this as the, the density of uh, some stochastic noise C uh, has to equals is negative. Uh, so this, uh, the plot here is, uh, essentially some sort of uh, symmetric uh, gradient distributions, uh, you can think about uh, what would be uh, the expected clip gradient in this case. Uh, some intuition in the one dimension carry over, some do not. Uh, for example, if you think about the regions within the yellow ellipsoid, actually it should be the exact circle, but due to rescaling, it looks like ellipsoid. Uh, it will recover the true gradient mean you wanna approximate. Uh, but the cancellation don't exactly happen outside of the clip boundary because now you have multiple directions. So you have to work harder in thinking about it. Uh, anyway, so, so one thing we can prove is that uh, when you think about the distribution of the, the stochastic gradient noise and also it's induced clip gradient, uh, when you take average, uh, you can prove something nice about it. Uh, when the gradient stochastic noise is symmetric, uh, you can prove that the inner product between the, the clip gradient and the true gradient is growing, uh, it's at least some function, some monotone function of the gradient norm, plus some probability bound, which you, you, for now you should think about as constant. So the H function, which is a monotone function, uh, uh, well, the monotone function of the gradient is really just uh, taking the main over either the gradient norm squared or some large, uh, some, some linear function in the gradient. Okay, 
uh, so so this is nice because uh, remember the, the clip DPSGD algorithm is really trying to minimize this inner product over, over time. And this actually, uh, when the distribution is symmetric, it will also put an upper bound on the sequence, on the cumulative gradient norm. So we actually will also drive the, the gradient norm uh, to zero uh, at this SM rate. Uh, but this theorem is actually making a, the explicit assumption that this uh, great stochastic noise is exactly symmetric. Uh, it's, it, it will never be the case to be exactly symmetric. So if, even the plus we have, it looks symmetric, but uh, it's only approximately symmetric uh, in terms of the angles. Uh, so uh, you can also provide some sort of distributional approximation. You know, if your, your distribution is only near symmetric, not exactly symmetric, uh, you can actually uh, decouple, uh, you can couple your distribution with a symmetric, a nearby symmetric distribution, P tilde, uh, and you can rewrite this inner product uh, according to your true stochastic gradient distribution uh, as the inner product with the nearby uh, symmetric distribution plus some gradient bias term. Right. Uh, so, so this gradient bias term may look a little bit scary, uh, but the key thing is you know, at the end, you're actually taking the difference between uh, the density for your distribution and the nearby distribution. And in particular, uh, for those who are familiar with this, uh, you can actually upper bound this by a form of Wasserstein distance uh, between the two distribution, your, your true stochastic gradient distributions and the nearby uh, symmetric distribution uh, with some, some metric function um, that's sort of motivated by this inner product. Okay. Um, so you can put these pieces together uh, and bring back the, the differential privacy component back to this uh, with the Gaussian noise perturbation. Uh, and you can also prove a, a similar form of uh, first order convergence bound uh, that looks like the following. Uh, so uh, what you can show is that uh, the weighted, uh, weighted average of the H of the gradient norm. Uh, so H again is a, some function that it depends on whether uh, the value is bigger than four, uh, three quarters over times C times Y. Uh, it would take either value of Y squared or, or uh, some linear function of Y. So, so here you can think about H is either a quadratic function of gradient norm um, when it's smaller than uh, C, three C over four. Um, and when it's bigger than three C over four, it's just a linear function of gradient norm. Um, and this weighted function that on the gradient norm, it will be uh, less than uh, some bounds that has two components. Uh, let, let me te tease off this one by one. The first term is really the sort of bound you would expect when you're doing the analysis by assuming uh, your, your, your function, underlying function is Lipschitz with a known Lipschitz constant and you, you're not doing any clipping. So you will recover this convergence bound. Uh, and the second term is really the clipping bias, which is characterized by some sort of Wasserstein's distances. Uh, so this slide is kind of dense. So, so maybe a good time to pause for me to take some questions as well. Um, I think there's a question in the chat window. I don't know if you can see that. Yes. Yeah. Oh. So, uh, so question from Jia Yuan. Uh, so outside of canceling boundary and discuss, so cast gradient cancel bias and gradient. Uh, so this is about one of the, the toy example. Uh, this might take a bit more time to explain. So let me get back to that question uh, at the end of talk, uh, but thanks for the question. Um, so, um, so let me move on. So, uh, okay, this is a theory you can, you can prove uh, if you think of the distribution as somewhat near symmetric, and you can basically argue this, the average Watson state distance will, will go down zero. But whether that's true in practice, uh, it's a bit hard to verify, right? Uh, you think about the gradient distribution is a really high dimensional object. Uh, it's, it's, there's no way you can directly visualize it. Um, so there, we, we have found some empirical evidences, uh, 
although they, they by, by no means uh, you know, uh, fully uh, certifying the symmetricity. But regardless, we went ahead to do it. Uh, so how do you visualize a gradient distribution and, and see whether it's symmetric? So one idea we wanted to use uh, is to take random projections uh, of the gradient distribution, of the, of the gradients. So essentially we are doing uh, almost something like the J Johnson Linder strides, the projections on the set of gradients uh, at each iteration under the two-dimensional space. So we can actually stare at it and visualize it. So uh, we are doing that for uh, two data set, uh, MS and CFAR 10. Uh, and we, we try to sample different epochs to, to see uh, when, after we do the, the random projection, what does the gradient distribution look like? Um, so the first column is really the epoch zero, by which we really mean before DPSGD start doing anything. If you look at a random two-dimensional projection of the, of the gradient distribution, it will look like this. Okay, so I will argue that it's just far from being symmetric. Uh, but as the, the training progresses, uh, the gradient distribution for the two data set actually uh, looks a bit more, more symmetric, symmetric. So these the three columns to the right is actually the, the random projection of the gradient distributions. Um, at least uh, it doesn't certify that it will be near symmetric at high dimensions, uh, but at least it helps us visualize what, what happened when you take a, a very low dimensional snapshot of it. Um, and we want to make sure that we, we're not getting lucky by just taking one random projection. We also, uh, for, for any epoch, we try to also take multiple shots of random projections. So we, we do that for multiple random matrices. Um, the, the shape looks different, but it, it looks like the, the, the kind of symmetricity structure may be somewhat preserved uh, uh, under the random projections uh, in, in this 2D visualization. Um, okay, so the theory go, sort of go beyond symmetric distribution, although we, we, we think of this as the main use case to think about, uh, but if you have distribution that's more possibly skewed uh, towards a gradient every round, um, you also will, will get this kind of property. If you take certain type of mixtures of symmetric distributions, you also uh, have this this property where the, the inner product upper bounds uh, the gradient norms. Um, a result I won't, won't get to talk about uh, today is uh, uh, the situation where maybe you, none of these nice properties in the gradient distribution happen, right? So you might be worried that, okay, you never have symmetricity. Maybe you, your model is just very different. You don't, you don't have this nice structure. Uh, so uh, another result we prove is that in the worst case, you can actually try to provide some sort of clipping bias cor correction method. Um, and interestingly, it's also taking a form of adding noise. Uh, the noise itself here is not actually providing a differential privacy guarantee, it's actually uh, adding noise before taking the clipping. Uh, so that itself actually doesn't help enforce privacy, at least we don't know how to prove it. Uh, but adding the pre-clipping noise actually help correct this kind of uh, clipping bias. Um, so uh, I won't have time to explain more, but you almost view it as a way to uh, trading up bias and variance. So you can decrease the variance by, incur by enforcing more variance in the gradient estimation, but at least you actually will obtain something closer to an unbiased estimate of the gradient. Um, so we have uh, some more experiments in the paper for this part. Um, roughly 12 minutes. So, so uh, I have about enough time to talk about the so second piece of work. Uh, and it will be shorter and uh, then I will uh, take some questions. The second part is think about sort of the dimensionality of this, uh, the structure of the gradients. And when, when can we leverage that to, to actually be get better, or more accurate algorithms? Okay. So let me briefly revisit this bound we proved in a couple of slides ago, which is showing we think about the, the average gradient norm over time, uh, it, it should be decreasing or it should be upper bounded by these quantities. Okay, so, so the first part really is thinking about the clipping bias, uh, which is somewhat characterized by the Wasserstein distance between the gradient distribution 
and a nearby uh, gradient distribution that is symmetric. Uh, and when this term is small, the clipping may, may not have the kind of adverse effect you, you think of. Um, this part, the first part is really the kind of bound you will get by, by doing this somewhat standard analysis on DP's SGD without a clipping. Uh, so the key quantity I want to highlight here is that the, the square root D dependence. So D is the number of parameters or the dimension or the ambient dimension of the parameter space. Um, so uh, typically when you do this kind of optimization analysis, uh, for example, uh, um, thinking about the analysis of gradient descent without a privacy, uh, you don't expect this kind of square root D dependent to, to show up. Um, but with privacy, you, you, it, it sort of creep in uh, in somewhat expected way because you're actually perturbing the gradient estimate you're using a D-dimensional Gaussian noise. So because you're actually changing the gradient by some random vector, random noise vector that itself has norm scaling with root D. So that will actually go into your optimization or convergence analysis. Um, and, and there's lower bound showing that this kind of square D dependence is unavoidable, um, uh, or at least the, the kind of dependence on D is unavoidable, and then maybe not exactly straight. Uh, but for, for some of the deep models, you might be worried about, worried about this kind of dependence, especially because uh, D could be in the orders of millions or billions. Um, and square root D may, may start getting bigger than the N for, for a lot of the, the tasks you might think about. Okay, so uh, effectively, should we actually pay for this uh, square root D? So D can be extremely large and we want to avoid paying that. Um, so it helps to actually look at the gradient structure again. Uh, in particular, uh, we want to actually understand what is the affected dimension of this, the, the gradient distribution. Uh, so, so here's what we do. Uh, there are similar experiments you can run, uh, but what we do is that we, we look at the gradient distribution at different epochs. So at, at each epoch, I'm gonna look at the Actually, by, by epoch, I really mean the iteration at the end of some epoch. I'm gonna look at the this distribution over the individual gradients, uh, which will give me a second moment matrix, which is uh, sort of taking out a product of the individual gradients and then take out. So this will be a huge matrix, uh, D by D matrix. Uh, it's a little scary, but yeah, if you have the time and energy, you, you can actually do eigenvalue uh, decomposition. Uh, and it turns out that the, the eigenvalue is actually highly concentrated with uh, only a very, very small number of uh, uh, dimension. So uh, I'm essentially plotting the top eigenvalues uh, for the second moment matrix for three runs of it. So one of them is actually, uh, so SGD without privacy, without adding any noise. So the, the right two plots are uh, DPSGD with, with different uh, variants for noise. So if you look at the, the eigenvalues sort of order uh, from right to left, so, so uh, you know, the, the right is the largest, uh, you can see that there are some high eigenvalues to the right, at least for some of the epochs, uh, but extremely quickly actually decay to something near zero. Um, so the dimension is actually much larger than a hundred, right? So you, you would think that mostly the, mo almost all of the non-zero eigenvalues uh, or the, the large eigenvalues is, con is basically captured in the first, or, uh, first hundred dimension. Um, the number of parameters here, even though this is a small scale experiment, it still has, uh, 130,000 uh, parameters. So on most of the dimension, there's actually not much, not much going on. The gradients just don't really live there. Um, but mo most of the gradients are actually contained in a very small dimensional subspace. In fact, uh, if you take uh, the subspace to have dimension something like 50, it might already contain most of the, the movements. Okay. so. Uh, I was talking to my colleague, uh, Random Banerjee and the student Yingxue about this. And we were nicely surprised because uh, 
uh, if we can leverage this kind of structure, you know, maybe you can avoid paying for the ambient dimension D and actually hopefully pay for the effective dimension that really capture most of the action inside the gradient space. Um, so we give a simple algorithm. Um, you know, the algorithm is not hard to think of. Um, so the, the framework that we, we would think about, the algorithm may actually have access to a small amount of public data. Okay, so you can think about these are public data that is available online on the internet and somehow it's already released in previous years. So uh, you don't actually need to provide privacy guarantee for this small public data. Uh, and what we do is that we will use a small set of public data to actually provide this kind of uh, effective subspace estimate. Um, so as usual, we'll, we'll use min, over rounds, we'll use mini batch to compute a noisy gradient estimate. Um, we'll use the small public data repeatedly to compute uh, some sort of projection onto the top K eigenspace uh, according to the second moment matrix. Um, and then instead of actually taking the full gradient update, uh, we'll only project the gradient update onto the top K eigen subspace and only update inside that top K eigen subspace. Okay, uh, so this is really the last line. So what's, what's going on here is that uh, you can think about this as doing the usual PDSGD, uh, DPSGD, uh, but now you are thinking about two sources of error, right? So uh, because of the projection, uh, you might actually have additional projection error, right? So you, you projection each gradient onto a lower dimensional subspace you might actually lose some of the norm. You might lose some of the direction due to the projection. So you might have additional error here. Um, but at the same time, you're actually gaining because of the projection. Now the noise vector also get projected down to from a D-dimensional space to a K-dimensional subspace. You're actually decreasing the gradient, uh, the Gaussian noise perturbation essentially from some, something that scale with square root D, the, the ambient dimension, to something that scale with square root K, the, the, the subspace you select. So you might actually have a lot of gain uh, by, by doing this kind of projection and when the noise is large. So essentially the algorithm allow you to basically strike a balance between uh, these two sorts of error. Um, so I won't go into analysis in here. Uh, the, 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 we have used some heavy weapons to analyze it, such as uh, how do we analyze the generalization error for, for this kind of uh, PCA-like object. Uh, but let's go into the experiment. So uh, this algorithm don't always beat the DPSGD, but it beat the DPSGD in the kind of regimes uh, you should care about or where privacy is really desirable. So uh, let me try to explain. Uh, it might help to mostly focus on the endless plot. The story are roughly the same. Uh, so PDPSGD is the projected differentially private uh, SGD, which is the algorithm we would like to propose. Uh, the blue line is DPSGD, which is the sort of the, the go-to algorithm or the state of the art that people tend to use. Um, this purple line is sort of uh, also doing projection, but using randomized projections. So R RPDP SGD is, is not doing any sort of a subspace estimation, but use a random projection down to a subspace. Uh, so, so this idea is sort of suggested by uh, open review reviewer and we, we decided to run. Um, but the key story, the key comparison is between the red line and the blue line. And we're looking at the accuracy. So uh, in the regime where epsilon is taking uh, larger values, so epsilon measures privacy loss. So larger values of privacy loss means less private. And also meaning you're adding less noise in this regime. Um, so when you're not adding that much noise, uh, the two algorithm to project the gradient, doing projection or not, they're somewhat on par with each other. Uh, uh, and you, when you think about balancing the two sources of error, it's probably because that, you know, when you're adding not that much noise, actually projection doesn't actually help you decrease the, the, the noise that much. 
but you actually pick up more more error due to the projection. So so you, you might actually do a bit worse. But when you start looking at regimes where you have high privacy or low values of epsilon, so here you're actually adding a lot more noise uh, for the gradient perturbation. Uh, this kind of projection-based mechanism actually start doing much better. Uh, so because the, this is a regime where you would like the trade-off to be that the Gaussian perturbation noise to, to come down. Um, so, and you can also visualize uh, the trajectory for specific values of epsilon. Uh, um, this is sort of what we handpick uh, one, two of the reg epsilon regimes uh, we run. Um, so, so when, when the algorithm, the, the projection method is actually doing better, uh, do, doing better along the way. Uh, this random projection is an interesting idea uh, on the purple line, but uh, it requires some more thought to, to make it work. So just blindly random projection does not work. Uh, let me quickly finish up the slides and maybe I can take questions. Uh, so one, one thing, one key quantity I think people should think about is that how large should the public data set be? Right? So in particular, uh, I, I've seen maybe some work that uses a lot of public data to, to, to also help you train uh, how you do the training. Um, and they also assume that public data is drawn from the same distribution. Uh, but if that's the case, if you have lots and lots of public data drawn from the same distribution, I think a key thing to remember is that when you, in that regime, you should not use a private data set at all. You should just directly use the public data. So we, a key quantity we, we want to have is that the, the public data is actually something quite small. And just using the public data would not get you any reasonable accuracy. Uh, the nice thing is that the, the, the number of public data we use is actually uh, very small uh, in, and you, you can start getting pretty reasonable accuracy even if you only have 50 examples in the public data set. And it gets better when you increase it to, to from 100 to 150, but the, the help actually quickly saturate. So in a sense that you don't actually need uh, many more examples to gain further improvement. Um, and you can also think about different choices of K. So uh, the dim dimension we project down to is actually uh, well under a hundred. Uh, so you're actually operating in a very small subspace. Okay, uh, I think I'm out, out of time. I apologize for that. So uh, I'm not gonna go through the slides, uh, but uh, you know, in summary, uh, there's really two parts of the talk and really, encourage us to think about some of the underlying geometric structure in the gradient. Uh, the first part of how we think about how this kind of geometric structure of the gradient, how about think about some of the flipping biases in, in some of these uh, practical algorithms. Uh, since this is a federated learning seminar, so I think I, I'm, I have to say something about federated learning. So I'm gonna do it in the last slide. Uh, so some of the, the intuition also carry over to uh, federated learning with or without privacy uh, along this gradient clipping part. So you also have thinking about this clipping bias when you're trying to enforce uh, privacy in federated learning, you also have to do some form of clipping. And there you also have to think about the structure of gradients across different devices. Uh, and this kind of geometric structure also help you bypass some of the ambient uh, dimension uh, uh, dependence in, in some of this uh, accuracy bound and practical performance. Okay, let me stop here. Uh, I can talk more offline, uh, but thanks for your time. Thanks, Stephen. That was a really interesting talk. Does anyone have, have questions for, for Stephen before we head out? Uh, by the way, I apologize for those of you who are, are just joining. I think there was some confusion about the the start time. <laughs> we, um, we changed uh, we changed times here in the in the U.S. for daylight savings time. So um, just in time to catch a last slide. And, and definitely check out the the recording, which will be posted on the the YouTube channel. Uh, I have maybe a couple of questions. Uh, thanks a lot for many the, or a couple. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> For the, for the very interesting talks. So yeah, maybe two questions. Uh, the first one is you, you're using the public data to estimate the, the subspace, right? So you could also yeah. 
try to privately estimate this subspace using the private data. I guess this, yeah. of course, you need to spend additional budget for that. So maybe you tried that and it doesn't really work well in, in practice, or I was wondering whether you, you, you tried that this direction. Yeah, so I think, uh, yeah, we, we tried that. The short answer, we tried it, it didn't quite work. Uh, I can explain why our approach didn't work. Is the, the kind of PCA or you know, eigenvalue decomposition method just from standard way of doing privacy, you also have to add noise scaling with the dimension. So it, yeah, so you don't immediately you know, get the kind of root K dependence or you still may inherit root D dependence. There are, however, smarter ways to do it that we haven't tried. Uh, one, one thing is we, we didn't get to it. Uh, uh, second thing is that these methods, they are more sophisticated, uh, but they are computationally even more expensive. Uh, so, so you can think about some sort of iterative noisy power method that, that sort of try to avoid uh, paying for the dimension upfront, but you have a sort of the adaptive method to try to get the shape of the lower dimension object first uh, and add noise sequentially. Uh, I think uh, from word of mouth, I think uh, some of my colleagues are trying that. Uh, I don't think the paper is out there yet, but there has been an attempt. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And maybe a quick question on the, maybe the kind of convergence rate or analysis that you get for this method. Of course, I guess the goal here is kind of to break the kind of even the lower bounds that are known for DPERM in the sense that, okay, yeah. it could be possible since you are making additional assumptions. So is it something that you're, you managed to get like lower dependence on dimension in particular in, in the convergence rate or? Yeah, so I guess implicitly we are doing that. So there's a lower bound to do that for in the worst case. In particular, in, importantly, the worst case result, the gradient will also be full dimensional. Uh, so in this case, we, we do implicitly sort of break the lower bound by making lots of assumptions. I don't think we have a concrete sort of way to break it because we are not give, particularly giving a specific type of loss function. I do want to give a shout out to some other work. Uh, oops, too many slides. So uh, to break the lower bound, there has been some attempt. Uh, so mostly in the regime of convex problems, when, sub, when you can clearly identify the effective dimension of the problem is much smaller than the number of parameters, uh, or you know, this class of what they call a generalized linear problem. So there you can much more easily characterize what the gradient looked like because it's a linear problem effectively. Uh, you can circumvent this lower bound as well. Uh, so yeah, so it'd be interesting what sort of, interesting regimes in which you can actually circumvent this root D dependence. All right, thanks a lot. Thanks. I had a quick question, Stephen. I was, I was curious, I think the, the analysis looking at the, the symmetry of the gradient uh -huh. is very interesting. What is the, what is your suggestion here maybe in terms of running this in practice then? Would, this, would the suggestion be to kind of actually uh, monitor this distribution and then potentially perform this perturbation to uh, adjust yeah. it theory or do you have any thoughts on kind of like the, the, the takeaway there for for how to improve this in practice yeah um i think what you said would be something i would say so basically uh, you finish my first first thought like uh if we have a good way to check uh for this kind of symmetricity condition um then maybe we, we we would just say uh you know don't worry about it uh the convergence will still happen um how to design the test uh, i think requires some more thought first if, if you only you're not using public data you probably need to be careful how to do it with privacy um and another thing maybe it's helpful to think about the plots uh yeah so another thing is that you don't always need this kind of symmetricity. In fact, like in our experiments, the first plot, you don't have this uh, symmetricity at all, uh, but somehow running the algorithms over time exhibit this kind of symmetricity over time. So, um, so this might go into the details of how do you think about, you know, pulling the trigger of actually using this uh, correction method uh, 
or just wait for it to get better. So there, there are some something to think about that's that could yeah. be quite interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a raised hand. Yeah. Let me see. I think I hopefully unmuted you. Yeah, go ahead. Ask ask your question. Uh, hey, thank you for the talk. Um, Hi, I wanted to ask a question about the first part, which was yeah. very clear to me. But uh, since I'm not an expert on differential privacy, I'm a little bit confused about the motivation. So uh -huh, uh -huh. what I the way I understood it is we yeah. don't want to converge to the same solution as uh, we don't want to converge to the solution of the original problem because it might not be yes. private. Yes. But at the same time, afterwards, you say like we want to uh, remove the bias of the clipping. While the bias might be actually helpful because we actually don't want to minimize the objective L. Yeah. So I, that's a very, very good question. So let me try to explain. So I totally agree that your intuition is right about privacy. We should not converge to the exact same minimizer. Like, we will not like, you know, because of the noise we add. Uh, but at the same time, we still want to approximately minimize the, 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 the underlying function. So you still want the gradient estimate you get from, from clipping or, or adding noise uh, to still point to a direction that help you minimize the direction, uh, minimize the loss function. So uh, maybe some of this example, I think maybe this is the, the kind of example you're referring to, uh, is that, uh, I'm just trying to give ways of constructing simple example where uh, with or without privacy, you are doomed. Like in, if you're in, in this regime and you're doing gradient clipping, uh, Gradient descent method with clipping would, would just not uh, help you converge to the optimum or even near optimum. Uh, so so the, the kind of plots I want to show is that you know uh, this will hold also without privacy. But the plus that you you not you not only not converging to the exact optimum, which is not our goal anyway, but you're also staying far from the optimum. So hopefully you should converge to a small neighborhood around the optimal. Uh, but this is the, the clipping bias preventing you from doing that. And is there anything, is there any bound, like, is it known how far the solution to the differentially private problem is from the solution of the original problem? Uh, yes. Uh, so this is part of band we're trying to show. Um, so I'm, I'm only showing the sort of non-convex case, but typically this is at the bound you could show. Um, if there's no clipping bias, this is the kind of bound you can show. And, and maybe part of your question is that even if you run T to infinity, this term is not gonna vanish. This, this term is, doesn't depend on T. No matter how long you run, uh, you will still inherit some sort of gap between the exact optimum. Uh, okay, this is pretty yeah. clear. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>